Amen. And that's why we're here, right? We are here for the very purpose of being changed, being renewed. Welcome to the Renew service. And that's what we're excited about today as we shared all summer long so far about being renewed from Paul's writings of Romans 12. So if you need a pen, you walked in, you got your sermon notes, you forgot, ah, I forgot a pen. These guys right here, our ushers, have a pen for you. Just raise your hand and say, I got a pen or I need a Bible. They're happy to give you either one, and you can either keep them or you can uh, put them back at the usher's table. Anytime during the service, if you need something, feel free to go back at the usher's table and they'll help you out. Take your Bibles, church, and, and turn to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, we're going to be looking at some of God's Word today, and so I want, to, I want to make sure that you can follow along with me. I'm reading out of the NIV today, and you follow along in the, in the translation that you have before you. While you're turning there, I want to just try to capture your, the moment, if I may, and, and your imaginations as we talk about a really a very a difficult subject and sometimes we don't even know where to land in our lives. So maybe this will be helpful as just to begin to, to, to prompt the juices of our life as to where, where, we're, where we need to be moving toward or what we'd be thinking about. I ran across this and I thought it was so worthy of being heard again. This person says, I went to church, heard about God, served him, and tried to live according to the biblical principles. But I didn't really know the God I was spending so many hours devoted to. I hated, or I hadn't, sorry, I hadn't really received his love for me. I hadn't experienced the peace and joy of his presence. I hadn't felt him speak to me or guide me directly. I wasn't experiencing the abundant life that God offers. Does that, does that kind of maybe resonate a little bit with you? Uh, it was maybe, maybe not, or just maybe on the edge of that? Does it sound like maybe your experience as you have served God for a long time and known about God, but you, you really never experienced the abundant life or the closeness that God has? And so I think it begs us to answer some questions or at least look at some questions that apply to our lives today as we, as we think about the pathways, and, which is the first one. How do I get my life on the right path? So that, and that has a pretty broad stroke to it, but, but what does that look like? Or maybe, maybe you could ask yourself, how can I change my life patterns, the habits, the addictions, or whatever it might be in your case or your scenario. How can I learn to change those? Or maybe this is your statement, and you can resonate with it. My life is in such turmoil. It is so dysfunctional. How can I ever get this straightened out? And maybe that may resonate a little bit more with you, and I, I've, I've heard that, that comment so many times. People just in a gasp, my life is so dysfunctional, I'll never get it right. And so we're, we're, we're clinging and we're, we're, we're trying to find any answers that we can find. And so much so that we, you know, we hear people, we talk to people, we share people about our story, and they say, well, you know, you got to have some boundaries. Or maybe they say, hey, I have a really good program that you should be part of. And in good sincerity of heart, they say you need to have, you know, go seek a counselor maybe. And there's nothing wrong with that and nothing wrong with any of these. And, and maybe they say, hey, I have a book I read that really impacted me. This would be a great book for you. And, and maybe you should look at that. Or, or maybe just finally, you know, as so many of us probably do need, we just need therapy. <laughs> Which there's nothing against any of these. I, trust me. But, but I think sometimes spiritually we're going about everything the wrong way. I mean, we're, we're looking into things spiritually that we really shouldn't be looking into spiritually. We should be looking to what God has for us spiritually. And maybe there's a simpler methodology. I don't know. But when we talk about the topic today, as your sermon notes say, we talk about repentance and faith, maybe there's something a little bit more there than we allow ourselves to move into. 
And so today, as we look at Matthew chapter 3, it's very interesting how Matthew just simply does away with, if you will, in chapter 2, does away with the, the birth of Jesus and, and the tr- quick travels and jumps right into Jesus at about 30 years old. Not a whole lot of background there that we have to give. It just simply starts out. And it says, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the desert, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And John's clothes were made of, of camel hair and had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, And do not think that you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, out of these stones, God can raise up the children for Abraham. Verse 10, the ax is ready, yet the root of the trees and every tree that does not produce fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water, he says, for repentance. But after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So, just to, just to elaborate a little bit on, on, on this passage, I'm not going to go too deeply into it, but simply John's crying out to the people, or the, the Jews primarily, that you are to be, come and, and be, be, repent. You are to come and, and return to God. In fact, they, they've gotten so far off track that they, they are serving other gods. And while that could be some idols... Don't forget that, that the word other gods can be a lot of things. A lot of things that distract us away from God himself completely. And so I don't know what that is in our life or your life or my life, but we need to be able to, to recognize it and to deal with it. Now the passage itself is, is really a, a, a prophetic passage coming to fruition because in Isaiah... In Isaiah chapter 40 of the Old Testament, we read these words. Now listen to the familiarity to them. The voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up. Every mountain and hill be made made low. The rough ground shall become level and the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all the people will. We'll see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Very much similar to what what we read in in Matthew chapter 3. And so why is that? I mean, here's here's the the, the comparison I want to make. They're both talking about repentance. They're both talking about the life of faith. So why is one shared as in John the Baptist? And as I grew up, I realized that the, the, and I was taught that the passage was talking about that, that John the Baptist is the one not, not only crying in the wilderness, but he's the one preparing the way for the Lord. And while I'm not saying that's wrong, I'm just simply saying I'm not exactly sure it's completely right. It's not that it's, that it's a bad interpretation, because certainly John the Baptist was the one. He was out there calling people to repentance, and in an aspect, preparing the way for the Lord. But when you go back into Isaiah and you see the fuller context where God is really talking about the children of Israel as a group, as a community, that God's saying, look, you guys need, need to, to cry out to me and prepare the way for me. And that's where I want you to just kind of grab to this morning as we 
talk through this. I don't know if it's a familiar passage or not. If you've never heard of it, well, I, you know, I'm going to help you through some of that. Um, but I, I, I pray that, that, that there is a calling into your heart today as John the Baptist is the one crying out to people, to us even today, even today, 2,000 years later, repent and live a life of faith. And so today, as you walked in, you may have this be your first day with us, and you've not heard all that we've gone through so far this summer, but we've talked about how the Lord always is running to us. And we've talked about how the Lord justifies us. He does these things. He's the one that sanctifies us. He's the atonement of our sins. We didn't earn anything, and we can't work for anything and really get it without God first preparing the way. And so he's done that. These are the foundations of what we believe. These are what we believe the Bible speaks to and says very clearly to us. And last week we we heard, as Pastor Chris shared, about, about living our life according to God's word. And when we do that, that our life will flourish. And God will bless us as we stay faithful to the understanding and the articulation in our life of his word. It's a beautiful life that we have to live. And I don't, want to, I don't want to put any damper on that. In fact, I, if I can, I'm just trying to heighten it a little bit this morning as we talk about this passage because I think that the passage is telling us specifically that we should do everything we can to help the Lord move toward us. Now, before you throw me into the fire as a heretic, I understand, and we've already processed through an awful lot, that God is the one who has prepared so much of the pathway for us. But we have a response that we have to give. You see, when Jesus prepares the way, or the Father's prepared the way, the Holy Spirit's working in your life and in my life to prepare the way, we have a choice to make. And in that choice, we have, to, we have to either own it or we step away from it. We can either step in or step or stay out of it. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Because I think as we process and press deeper into the good things of God, the beautiful life of God, it's as if he's, he's calling out to us saying, don't shut me out. Make space for me. Prepare a way for me. Make straight a highway. And in, and in essence, if we want God in our lives, we need to make a place for him to enter. You see, that's what the text really is saying. That God is calling us to make a way for him, both, I think, in community as well as individually, God's crying out. Not just that John the Baptist goes out and prepares a way. Not that Jesus just goes out and prepares the way. Not just that the prophet Isaiah goes out and prepares the way and, and calls it all out and says, it's got to go that way. But we, too, have a point and a place that we get to participate in this. That God is saying, I want you to, to step in. We have a response to make, and, and thus we, we anchor into one of our core beliefs as Christians. It says that we believe that for men and women to appropriate what God's provenient grace has made possible, let me stop there, let me just explain that real quick. Big words all of a sudden. That, that God wants, for what God has for us, all the great promises that God has for us, those things for us to, to receive them, that, that God's grace before, God's calling grace that he's called to you, that he's knocking on your door every day, not only for, for first-time salvation, but also for you to change, to, to, to confess, to make sure that you're, that you're living the right life. If we're going to enjoy these great promises of God's preparing the way for us, then we must voluntarily respond in repentance and faith. The ability comes from God, not us. But we act on that as individuals. So basically, if you want to enjoy the good life of God, you're going to have to take hold of the gift. You're going to have to grab on to the gift that God's showing out there. In the wilderness, it says, prepare the way for the Lord. Listen to the wording. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So God's calling us to, to consider 
our wilderness where we are right now. So you might, you, might be, you might be here or you might be watching this online and you've never believed in Jesus in your life. And you're, you're still trying to navigate and you're, you don't know why, but you keep just hitting walls and it's hurting your head and it's hurting your body and, and you're tired of it. And God's been calling to you, I'm just saying that out loud, God's been calling to you to make a change. And the change is to repent and have faith that believes. But that's not the only wilderness experience because believers can have wilderness experiences too. Oh, yes, we can get off track. Oh, yes, we can get out of line. Oh, absolutely, we can wander away and and we can wander for a long time. Some people have wandered for 40 years. Just throwing that, that great number out there. And God's calling, God's calling, God's calling, God's calling. And he won't quit, and he does not want anyone to perish, but that all would come to salvation in him. That's his call. That's just who he is. So you might be in a, in, a, in, a, in a spiritual wilderness today. And if you're not, and you're like, I just don't have any, any wildernesses right now at all, Pastor. Praise the Lord then, because we, we want to hang around you. And, and frankly, if you don't, would you just come down here? We're going to touch you. We want to just touch you. We just want to have a little bit of that in our lives. Give everybody a high five, right? And I'm not saying that you have them. I'm just simply saying that they are, they're, they're real. And there's areas in our life, and it might be spiritual. Listen, it might be moral. It might be ethical. It might be an, an emotional desert or an emotional wasteland right now. But we're all trying to get through this desert and get into the oasis of God because real spiritual deserts are simply the results of when God's life-giving waters are not present. We're just dry. We're just empty. Not because of God, but because something's blocking the water flow. And so in this passage, which is so fun for me, and I love that the way this, this is just given out to us, it says prepare the way, number one, prepare the way. And, and then what it's saying is prepare the way for my arrival. Prepare the way for, for me coming to you. And so it's as if God is speaking to you and to me both, both through Isaiah and through John the Baptist, God's saying, prepare the way for me to come. And the very first thing that, that we have to understand in this is that the, the first preparation stage has got to be repentance. It's, it's got to be where we turn away from the things of the world, the idols that we, that we worship, and whatever that could be, I mean, it may not be the, you know, a totem pole. You may not be worshiping a, a piece of wood, but maybe it's another God. Maybe you're just saying, I, I just believe in all the gods. Well, good luck with that because there is only one true God. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other. So you've you got to turn away from that. And the word repentance says turn away from that. It means turn directly to God and let him be the one alone. And so if you're anchoring your, yourself in, in all these, these things that are not God, not, not Jesus, not the Holy Spirit, then you need to repent. You need to say, God, I'm sorry. I turn away from them and I turn to you. And that's the word repentance. And that's what I think it's the very first step that we open the door, we prepare the way, we prepare. Because God's not going to come into your life and say, you've repented. He wouldn't do that. It has to be you and me. We have to make that step. And so it's a voluntary step on us to say, I, I'm, you're right, God. I'm sorry. I'm done with this lifestyle. And so it's preparing a way. Now catch this. Repentance begins to open the floodgates, opens the door for God to do what? For us to go to him? Well, yes, in part, but really for God to come to us. Because it says, the scripture says, prepare the way for the Lord to come to us. God does run to us. We rarely run to him. God's always running to us. And so that door, that, that pathway has to be cleared, has to be initiated. But herein lies the greatest challenge for every believer and non-believer in this room and online hearing this right now today. It's doing it God's way. 
It is so hard for us to do it God's way because we think we can do it better. Whose way? My way, our way, absolutely. And it's such a great challenge for us. And it was for the Israelites who chose other gods as they, as they meandered around, as they, as they went through the, the life and, and the challenges and the wanderings. And while God's grace is deep and it is powerful, there are requirements for us to follow and, and prepare for him to come. Not works. I'm not talking about works. And don't, please don't hear that. I'm saying, you know, you got works to do. No, no, no. This is not about works. This is simply about a responsibility, a response to God. That I can open the doors through my, my, my belief and my repentance. And I can open the door to faith because without repentance, there is no faith. But there's a lot of religiousness. Without repentance, there is no faith, but there is a lot of religiousness. Let me just come back to that in a second. So God's calling us out. John the Baptist is calling us out to make way for the Lord to come quickly to us. While it's God's work in us that's convicting us and convincing us, John was calling us to say, look, here's what I need you to do. I want you to, to have a willful change of mind and renounce sin and long for righteousness, long for a godly sorrow and a confession of the past sins for all the wrongdoings and the resolution to reform or renew your life. It's incredible what he's calling us to do. But that's been the story from the get-go. From all the Bible, throughout the beginning, it talks about the same pathway so, maybe like the person I read about that you've been to church and you've been, you've been coming for a long time and you've been, you grew up in the church or whatnot and, and maybe you're like, I never did experience God that way. I've never heard God speak to me. I've never been able to enjoy the, 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 the beautiful harmony of living with God. Maybe because we have this religiousness in us that we've never stopped to say, wow, I need to repent. I'm not stop. I've never I've never even knew I was supposed to do that. To stop and say, God, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And I turn away from the things over here that are causing me the pain. And I turn to you where I'm going to find joy and I'm going to find rescue out of that pain. And then the text goes on. And it, and, 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 and it, it talks about the, the living of the life of faith and the fullness of Christ that we get to have as long as we allow ourselves to prepare the way to, to repent and then make straight the way, it says. Straighten the way. Because we are notorious for having bends in our life. As I don't know how because the, the, the place of, really the, the, the land in, in the Jordan uh, on the other on the other side of Israel, really isn't that big of a property, a geographic location, but the Israelites managed to spend forty years there, <laughs> and I just don't quite understand that. Like, how could you travel, you know, something the size of I don't know maybe um, Kentucky for forty years? It's not that big of an area, and frankly, it's pretty ugly. So I'm imagine, I just can't even imagine how, the, how, you can, how you can do that. But I'm guessing there's going to be a lot of bending and turning and a lot of going back like, hey, haven't we been here before? You know what I'm saying? But we're notorious for that. But our, our, after repentance, our life should step forward into a faith that begins to journey with God, both internally and externally. And so we need to straighten out our lives as, as best we can. And I, have a, I think I have a good picture that helps you maybe visually see this, how we tend to want to get from point A to point B, uh, especially a spiritual journey. So maybe that will help you out. This, this is really what we, our journey looks like because we're thinking, well, I'm going to try this over here. Oh, that didn't work, so I'm going to go back over here. That's what's working better. You know? and, oh, that didn't work. And, I'm, and, and we just keep trying when really God's saying, hey, I just want you to I just, just come from point A to point B. It's not that far, but we sure know how to make it a long ways. We really know how to, to create some time. And here's the thing. Now, God can travel that road with you and will travel that road with you, but wouldn't it be quicker to just start from the beginning to the end and just go straight, right? 
Straighten the pathway is what it's saying. After you prepare the way, straighten it. Straighten it out for God. Quit meandering. Quit, quit making crazy pathways. But that's what we do. And so I just want to call you into some thoughts real quick as to what, where, where do you stray? Where, where, where do you find that a turn? Where do you get off going this way? And, and you, you feel like you know you're supposed to go this way, but you end up going this way. Where is that for you? And I'm not looking for answers. I'm just simply trying to help you process a little bit of what I'm saying where do we navigate down roads that we shouldn't travel? Where can we straighten out how we live so that God can work miracles in our lives? Or where can we straighten out our lives so our Lord can bring us spiritual maturity and fullness in his power and his presence? And maybe lastly, how can we straighten out our lives so we can hear the Holy Spirit clearly, concisely? Where's where that for you? How can you? What could you do to straighten out your pathway? Because the world's competing for you. The enemy, Satan's competing for you, your mind, your heart, and your soul. So I echo the words of the Apostle Paul of the church in Thessalonica, and he said, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole body, soul, spirit be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord. Just basically what he's saying, I pray for you that you just make a straight path for God, that he'll come. And then we go to the create a highway, it says in our text, create a highway number three which means create a highway that is, that is easy to travel. Get rid of the obstacles in the way. Get rid of them. You have to do that. God's not going to come in and clean house for you. He's not going to come in and say, hey, I'm just going to wipe it all away. He wants you to be part of this faith journey as well. And so he calls you to, to create a highway for him to come closer, to come more to you, and come quickly to you. And so we create this physical path, such as a freeway, if I may. And you travel the freeway, and you know the freeway, and you realize the only thing that's really in your way on the freeway is other people. That's a message for another time. Because it's a really good message. But, nonetheless... So in living in Arizona, as long as I did, I, I have the privilege of understanding what it is to create a, a highway for the Lord. So maybe this visual will help you. The long, straight roads of Arizona that take forever to get from point A to point B. And I'm not necessarily talking about the length of the road, but what I want you to see is the clarity of the road. It's a straight point A to point B road. It's very simple. If you want to get there fast, make it wide enough that you can travel easily on it. Now, that's going to take some time, of course, because you've got to clear the way. You've got to create a way. You've got to get the junk out of the way. You've got to clear the trees. And frankly, there's valleys and there's, and there's obstacles that are in the way that you have to overcome. Welcome to life. That's the fun of the journey. We get to do this, and God will come closer and quicker to us the more that we straighten out the road. And so Isaiah says that every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and every hill made low, and the rough ground shall become level, and the rugged places a plain. So in the valleys... Sometimes in our valleys that we have to raise the valleys up, you understand that. We just have to build some bridges just to raise the valleys up. And so we don't have to go down in the valley necessarily, but if you want to go down the valley and you want to clear the way, then let that be a good valley road for you. But, or you can build the bridge. If you want the mountains and the hills made low, and as you excavate and as you maybe bore through the hills and make a tunnel, it doesn't matter how you get there, but make it a wide straight road so God can come to you quicker and God can come to you easier. You see, when there's things in the way of God, he's not going to go out there and just and knock them out of the way for you. He's just not going to do it. He'll help you. He'll give you the insights. But you see, you have to do the clearing. You have to do the clearing. Sometimes when we pray, God, take away this sin, God's saying, I'd love to, but what I'd really like you to do is get rid of it out of your life and seek me. Let Clear that out so I can come to you. And then it says, of course, make the rugged places plain 
throwing out the, the rocks and the brush and the things that just create the havoc of, of stumbling. And hey, you understand what I'm saying. It's making a way, to God, to come to you. You're preparing the way for him to quickly come to your heart and to your life. And many people will pray, Lord, I'm in a jam. I need help. And they'll not repent. And they'll not, not clear the way. They'll just remain there expecting God to come. And then they get all mad because God didn't come. Because, and, and God's saying, I, I can't come. You're, you got junk in the way. Get the junk out of the way. I mean, I see, that's, this is why I love this passage. It calls us to, to, to live a life of humility and, and get rid of the self-righteousness and the self-security and, and to change from dishonesty to truthfulness and simplicity and, and to leave the, the unapproachable arrogance of our life and, and cling to him and his kindness and his submission. I mean, basically what it's saying to us is make this highway, this freeway for the Lord who's ready to come and deliver healing and insight and to reclaim you for himself alone. Inwardly, outwardly, for his glory. Now you might be thinking, ah, you know, I don't, I don't know, Pastor. I just don't know if I have anything. I'm not even sure exactly what that means to, to get the rocks and get the bushes out and, and, to, and to make these. Well, I'm glad you asked that question because I have some thoughts for you. Let me help you out from the Apostle Paul as he talked to the church at Corinth or, or, or Colossae. He said, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Let me give you the list. Here we go. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. But you, however, used to walk in these ways in life that you once lived and you no longer live. But here's the next list. A little easier to swallow. You must now rid yourself of all such things such as anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off the old self and its practices. Wow. Did that help you? Did that, or did that just realize, make you realize that you have some rocks in the road? I got some brush going on here. I got some valleys I'm going to have to get through. Yeah, yeah, that's the whole point. I want you to wrestle with this. I want you to deal with this a little bit because it takes that, that heart of repentance to clear the way for the Lord to come. Oh, don't get me wrong. I, I believe that, that, that you're saved. I believe that I'm saved. But I think there's obstacles in our life that, that God just simply won't penetrate through until we're, we're willing and truthfully ready to deal with them. And I, and I could spend some time on these last ones here. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language. And maybe some of you can raise your hand on some of those things. And now you're wondering why God's not in my life that I can experience him. Because maybe we have some blockades here. So clear the way, traveler. Clear the way, Christian. Create the highway. Allow him to continuously Move closer to your life. And maybe it's easier said, a better picture for some of you would just be like, you got some junk in the closets of your life. Get them out. Get them out and let God get in. Maybe that, that helps you a little bit and just a little better visual for some. The more you clear out, the more the better the, the living is. And frankly, the house doesn't smell anymore and, and you're happy to invite God in. So repentance is that first step, that first transformational step that we've got to take. But sometimes we need to take it more often than we think we do. And it's not so bad when God, when, you, when God points out that, hey, you just said something that wasn't very edifying to me. Yes, Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I confess that and I repent. I don't, I don't want to do that in my life. And then this faith step just continues to go. And our journey with him in faith continues, not out of religion, not out of a set of rules, not as a slave to, to, to some type of form of, of uh, organizational, but simply God moving with us, toward us, and we enjoy his company along the pathway, and we get to experience him. Not works. Not works. I'm not talking about works. 
I'm just simply talking about accepting, embracing, implementing, operating his, his life in our life and coming in, in, in alignment with him. That's what I'm talking about this morning. And I think that there are things in your life that when you repent and take these steps of, of great faith, that God will come along and you'll, and you'll experience him. Why do I know that? I've experienced myself. I know other people here have to have as well. So I want you to be encouraged and to find this passage as a joyous passage to say, yeah, repentance and faith isn't something that I should be, sh you know, like, oh, we, uh, no, it's just something we embrace. So I want to encourage you this morning, whether you've accepted Jesus or not, today's a good day to do that. And I've just given you the pathway. Repent today. Tell them you're sorry. And take that step, that faith journey. Father, pray with me. Father, as we come before you, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we've had to hear your word, to look into your scripture.